Good morning, friends and family. I have not disappeared. <laughs> we came home at like one in the morning on the Sabbath day, which is Sunday when I said I was not going to be filming because I was traveling. And then yesterday when I finally woke up, our air conditioning was broken and I live in Vegas and it's over 100 degrees. And so we were scrambling around trying to get that done. I had a photo shoot. There was all kinds of stuff going on. So I appreciate your patience in waiting for the last two days lessons. And then for today's lesson, I will see if I can try to film that later on today. If not, that will be combined with tomorrow's lesson. So thank you for bearing with me on these days when I have to skip a day or two and I have to combine lessons. I know you guys understand, but there are a few people who I still feel like I need to explain myself to just because they may be new and they may not understand, you know, the whole undertaking of this task and how much time it actually takes. So thank you again for your grace and your mercy in that. But today we are covering lessons one 90 and 191 we are in the book of isaiah there is so much and that too it took a really long time to unpack these chapters because i didn't want to rush through it you know this is huge prophecy that points to the coming of jesus and i did not want to miss anything so before we get into it i would love for you to help out by liking this video making sure you're subscribed to the channel and hitting the notification bell but also connecting with us in our facebook group we have got amazing conversation in there and i've got a new friend helping me out monica is starting to make pdfs of our notes that are in the description box i know some people struggle to get access to the notes so she's helping us out there she's making albums where we are going to have the ability to go into certain books and certain days to hold conversations so things are happening around here and I am so excited about it I hope you guys are too so without further ado let's get started our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name you are holy God and we cry out with the angels holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty Father Son Holy Spirit the Godhead three in one. We recognize who you are and how powerful you are, Lord. Our human minds can't even comprehend it, but for whatever it's worth, Lord, we are here to be able to draw near to you. So I pray that you will be with us today. Lord, forgive us for our sins and help us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Lord, give us today our daily bread, our manna. God, as you have provided your word for us, thank you for the time too, that we get to sit here before you in your presence and read it. Open our eyes, ears, and hearts to understand your word today, Lord. And I pray, God, that it will be your word that flows through me even and through the comments, God. Please don't lead us into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. Keep us from the evil one. Protect us. Be our defender. And I pray, Lord, where there is fear or worry or anxiety, God, that you will cast it out right now and that you will bring us that peace that surpasses all understanding because that is what you have called us to do is to not fear Lord but to fear you to keep our eyes on you and to be in the word and solid in it Lord so we stand upon that rock today we love you and we thank you again for this time together as a family in Jesus name amen all right guys as we go through these books again I don't have my overhead filming capacity right now so bear with me as we get through this I am trying to do a voiceover over the actual filming of the sections that we are in. So we're in the book of Isaiah today. This is one of the books of the major prophets, the author being Isaiah himself. This was contested at some point, but I truly believe it is Isaiah. And this is written over the period of 780 and 640 BC, or at least the prophecy takes place there. So Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. He was a good man. He was a husband, a father, and a bold man of faith. So much so that some people have actually said that the book of Isaiah is actually the fifth gospel. I'm not going to go as far to say that, but I thought it was interesting at least to note it. It is a book of prophetic poetry. It has a lot of parallelism. So we will th see things that are spoken of that will say it is like this. And this revelation in this book is still very relevant for us today because it was written not only for the people of that day, but also for us. And so as it, this is broken down, chapters 1 through 39 are written for the 8th century Israelites. It speaks of the judgment on idolatry and immorality. Chapters 40 through 55, it gives comfort to the future generation of those who have been exiled. And then chapters 56 through 66 is written for the Jews who returned to Israel before the temple 
was rebuilt and it prophesies um, the coming of Jesus, the second coming, I believe. So we start off here with Isaiah, who is the son of Amos, and his prophet prophecies are very confrontational, but they also are full of exhortation and then give warnings, which means that he becomes a very unpopular person to the people. I mean, anytime you are warned by somebody, corrected by someone, our human nature tends to not like those people, right? I mean, our human, our flesh starts to well up with defense. And that is what happened with Isaiah. So verse one, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So notice that his word comes through a vision. The most faithful people in the world, on this earth, in this time of humanity, will be people of vision. The most faithful can see things. A lot of people like to say, oh, you all have a blind faith. But the funny thing is, is it's quite the opposite because the more faith you have, the more you can actually see the things of God. And so faith is not blind, actually. We are able to see more the more that our faith increases. So this is what he says. And this is during a time of prosperity, the people have become very apathetic. Uh, in the sense that they everything's going right for them, you know? And so they're like, ah, que sera, sera, whatever. And this chapter is based during the time of King Ahaz, who is a wicked king. So there's a lot of wickedness going on in Judah in the south. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. So he is calling upon these the heavens and the earth as witnesses. So all people, not just Judah, everybody listen to this, for the Lord has spoken. Children, have I reared and brought up. So this is very personal for God to speak these words when he calls his people children, or in other words, sons. And he is basically saying, you all have been ungrateful children who have been refusing to submit to the words that I've spoken. And I think for any of us who are parents, that is one of the most irritating things is when our children are disobedient or who are not listening. So children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. Now we know that the ox and donkey are not the smartest animals. If you've ever heard the term, he's as dumb as an ox or as dumb as a donkey. So these are dumb animals. And he is saying they're even better than you because at least they don't rebel. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So at this point, God is saying the animals are more faithful servants of God than the best human. (laughs) Because human nature, we are rebellious and stubborn just by nature. And animals actually even though it doesn't seem that way, we look at animals and say, gosh, you're so dumb. You know, we think we are so smart and so mighty. And granted, we've been given dominion over animals, but it is saying here at this point, you all are a little bit more dumb than these dumbest of animals, right? So a sinful nation, verse four, ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have utterly, or they are utterly estranged. So this term, Holy One of Israel, this is one of the favorite terms of Isaiah that he likes to use, referring to God, which means, you know, God is profoundly different from all humanity. He is holy. He is set apart. And with a special relationship, though, with his people, he is the Holy One of Israel. So Holy God of his people. And sadly, he is saying that they have dealt corruptly. They have been evil, laden with iniquity. They've become so fat that they have essentially forgotten God. And now we see in verse 5, the affliction upon them. Why will you still be struck down? The thing is, God doesn't want us to fail. So this is the question that he is posing here. Why will you continue to fall? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. So he's basically saying everyone and everything is sick around here. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. So this sole of the foot into the head, this is giving this picture almost of like a wounded soldier, but bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. 
Verse 7, your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire in your very presence. Foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. This referring to Syria, Edom, the Philistines, and Assyria who are all overthrowing them at this point. So they are ravaged by war. And the daughter of Zion is left. So daughter of Zion referring to Israel. Like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. So now he's calling them to repent. If the Lord of hosts, and this is another favorite term that refers to God used by Isaiah, which means God is over all powers of heaven and earth. He is holy and he is sovereign. So if the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors or a remnant, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Now we know that Sodom and Gomorrah are the epitome of sinfulness. And most people would associate Sodom and Gomorrah with the sin of homosexuality. I mean, that's where the term sodomy comes from. It is one of their biggest sins. However, Ezekiel also says that the root of Sodom and Gomorrah's sin was actually the heaping of luxury upon themselves with no compassion for the poor. That is where their sin actually stemmed from. That was spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 16. And God will always preserve a remnant out of faithfulness to the Abrahamic covenant. The fact that he said that there will always be uh, a remnant left from the people. I mean, he loved Abraham. His people would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Well, how can that happen if there isn't a remnant left to continue? So that is why he continues to save some of the people. So going back, you guys are basically like Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 10, now he is speaking to the leaders. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So he's like, listen to what the word of God is saying. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of the lambs or of goats. So, of course, God desires sacrifice. I mean, he created the sacrificial system, but he doesn't want it. He doesn't want the animals. He doesn't want the blood. He doesn't need it. What he wants is the people's heart. So what's happening here is the people are very disobedient. They're mistreating others. So he's like, I don't want your sacrifice. Because we know in 1 Samuel, he said to obey is better than sacrifice. So let's do a heart check. Are our sacrifices clothed in obedience? Because if they're not, then God doesn't want them. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts. Notice he's saying your and not mine. So this is almost kind of sarcastic. The fact that he is like, you have taken my... uh, sacred, holy feasts and days and seasons, and you have manipulated them for yourselves. These sacred seasons were not being celebrated out of the love for God. They were becoming very religious. These were very empty practices at this point. So God is speaking an indictment upon that. They have become a burden to me. and I am weary of bearing them. When you have spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. So their prayers at this point are empty. They are hollow and useless. And God is not having it. He's not going to listen or answer them. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. So right here, he is giving us steps on how to repent. If we have ever asked the question, Lord, have I repented enough? Have I done enough to be forgiven of my sin? Then read these verses and say, have I done these things? Have I removed the evil? Have I washed myself uh, myself and made myself clean? Have I stopped doing evil? Have I learned to do good? Do I seek justice? Have I corrected oppression? Have I brought justice to those in need? And these people at this point have been treating the fatherless and the widow and those who are oppressed poorly. They have been taking advantage, in fact, of them. 
So now he is saying, come now. So he's called them to repentance. And then he is saying, this is what will happen. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Now, when he says reason together, um, this there have been other translations that have used the word, come let us dispute together. But reason together is... In, well, at least according to the ESV, the more proper use of the word, because God's ways really are the most reasonable ways to live. I mean, he has created the way to live because it is the best way. He is basically saying, let's come to a legal decision with no compromise here. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So he's like, you're not innocent here, but I am willing to forgive you if you will repent. And the same deal is for us. Of course, we know with Jesus, obviously, with our sins, the power and the guilt and the shame, the domination, the terror and the pain of sin is eliminated by the blood. Our sins, which are red like crimson, they will become like wool. They will become white as snow. And I'm just like, thank you, Jesus, for all of the sin that I have committed and that I will commit in the future because of your blood, because I'm covered by it. It shall be white as snow in your eyes. So he's saying, if, so here we are, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good land. So this is a promise for them. If you are willing to do the things I'm telling you, and if you're obedient to them, then I will bless you. But (laughs) here's the kicker. If you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there is finality here in this word. And we have a promise and then we have a threat. You can either be willing to obey or refuse to obey and rebel against what the Lord is saying. So it's choosing between the blessing and the curse at this point. Now, when he says, come now, in the beginning of verse 18. He is like, listen, there is some urgency here in this word that I'm speaking because tomorrow is not promised. And God still says that today. This entire word, this every day that we come to read, that is God calling us with urgency. Like, come now because you don't know if you are going to be here tomorrow. You don't even know if you'll be here in the next minute. You know, God can take our lives our lives at any moment. And this is why there is such an urgency for his word to get spread throughout the earth because every person is precious to God. He wants every person on this earth to be saved and to come to him. So this come now is not only a call for us to come personally to him, but it's a call for us to get others to come to him. Verse 21. So now we see the purification for Israel. We see it spoken as a prophecy of judgment, verses 21 through 26, and then God's sentencing in verses 27 through 31. How the faithful city has become a whore. So they have forsaken their relationship, kind of like this marriage covenant between the people and God. She who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. So he is saying, your silver is impure and unrefined. Dross is that impurity in the silver or metals. And their best wine is mixed with water, meaning your faith is impure and diluted. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore, the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts meaning he is the warrior with all of the angels at their battle ready. They are ready and willing to do anything that the Lord commands them to do. The mighty one of Israel, ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you. So this hand is the same hand that delivered them will now be turned against them. And I will smelt away your dross with lie and remove all your alloy. So these are um, the impurities. Once again, the dross and the alloy or alloy, And God is saying, I'm going to purify you all 
so that I can remove those things. So this purification process, it's not a fun one. It doesn't feel good. You are being refined and purified by fire, by tribulation trials, but in the end, it is best for you. So they are being purified here from social injustice. And I will restore, verse 26, your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. And I wrote here, hashtag goal. The goal for our lives even is the same as it is for Israel. It is to be restored and to be called righteousness, to be called faithful. So God's redemption and restoration, they're always done with justice and righteousness, never at the expense of justice and righteousness. So they go hand in hand here. Verse 27, Zion shall be redeemed by justice. Redeemed meaning it shall be bought with a price, ransomed. And of course, we have been bought with a price by Jesus. So we are the people have been grafted into Israel, the people of God. And those in her who repent by righteousness, but rebels and sinners shall be broken together and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. So when people turn from trusting the fair and loving God, they will start oppressing the poor and the helpless, which is what has happened here. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks, the oaks referring to um, the sacred tree that has been worshipped for fertility rites or spirits. And we know that these kinds of worshiping, or this kind of worshiping, or these kinds of gods, they fail to save. So you're going to be ashamed of the fact that you've been worshiping this. And we should be ashamed, but we don't live in that shame and condemnation. But ashamed enough to bring us to repentance, to the fact that we will no longer be indifferent or careless with our sin. So they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. So basically you are going to dry up, and you're going to wither away. And the strong shall become tender, and his work a spark. Both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. So the strong, meaning those who have been dominating uh, as rulers of Israel, and then his work, meaning this injustice that's been going on, both of them will burn together. This is the gracious work of God. This is his purifying judgment upon them. But referring to the kind of this spiritual dryness that God's fire will consume if they are unrepentant. And remember in Psalms where it said, the man who delights in the Lord shall be like a tree whose leaf doesn't wither. Well, they are obviously not delighting in the Lord at this point because their trees are withering or that is what the prophecy is being spoken of. Chapter two. This chapter has been said that it is speaking of the temple and the rebuilding of the temple. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem so this is going to show the glory of the reign of Jesus. It shall come to pass in the latter days. The latter days meaning, one, the fact that it was initiated by the first coming of Jesus, but, but fulfilled in the second coming of him. So that the latter days, ultimately speaking of the future reign of Jesus or the millennium. So the time of the Messiah. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord or the temple shall be established as the highest of the mountains. So this is going to be a copy of the heavenly reality of God on the throne. This temple will be rebuilt. It shall be a, uh, and shall be lifted up above the hills. So God wants us also, even now, to be lifted up High, to be the highest of the mountains. He always wants us to go higher, but we have this choice of whether or not we are going to go higher with him or we're gonna stay in the hills. Here where it says they shall be lifted above the hills. So heart check, do you want to go higher or do you wanna simply just stay in the hills, status quo, no Lord, I don't want to do the things that you're calling me to do because it's too hard, God. I wanna just stay here in the comfort of where I'm at. So do you want to go higher or stay in the hills? And how can we build our temple on the mount? Well, we can build it on the mountain of Sinai where the law was given, where the word was established. 
in the Mount of Pisgah where Moses saw the promised land, meaning we have an eternal perspective. The Mount of Carmel where Elijah called down fire from heaven, meaning the Holy Spirit that burns in us. The Mount of Hermon, which is the Mount of Transfiguration where we are transformed by the Spirit of God. Or the Mount of Olives where Jesus prayed. Are we going to be people of prayer? Or ultimately the Mount of Calvary where Jesus paid the price. Are we willing to then sacrifice our lives, lay down our lives as a mirror of what Jesus did for us? So here in verse, the end of verse two, it says, and all the nations shall flow to it. So remember when I was just saying, God wants all people to come to repentance and to come to him. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his way and that we may walk in his paths. So in this time of when Jesus reigns again, People are going to flock and they are going to come to repentance. They are going to see the glory of God. They are going to want to learn from him. They are going to want to walk in his paths and live in obedience. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. So because Jesus will be the ultimate authority on the earth, there will be no wars. He will actually be the one to judge between the nations. He will bring correction on an international scale. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. So meaning their swords will become tools of trade instead. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. So there will be an end to all weapons and wars because of the reign of the Prince of Peace. So he will be enforcing righteousness ultimately. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the right of the Lord. So why wait? You know, this is an invitation for us even now. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The light referring to the law that illuminates our path. It is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. So this is like a metaphor, right? God's word is going to help us, teach us how to live our lives. And this life with Jesus shouldn't be a dark one. It shouldn't be depressing. It shouldn't be discouraging. It should actually lift you up. It should be encouraging to you. So follow him today. Read the word today. We're all doing that. I'm not preaching to you guys, but I'm just uh, saying what God was revealing to my heart in this time of reading. And so now we see the corruption in Judah and the chastening of that. For you have rejected your people, verse 6, the house of Jacob. So God is basically saying, um, here's your sentencing. This is the present condition, but it's not a permanent one at this point. Because they are full of things from the east and of fortune tellers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with the children of foreigners. So they have made these ungodly alliances. They have misplaced confidence. And verse seven, their land now is filled with silver and gold and there's no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses and there's no end to their chariots. So they're wealthy here. They are prospering. And God is not anti-wealth, but he is anti-greed and he is anti-love of money. And that is what is taking place here. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. So they are becoming people of self-importance. They are worshiping their own success. So again, God is not anti-success, nothing wrong with being successful, but where it becomes wrong is when that becomes your whole world and you begin to almost worship it. So there's lots of worship going on, but worship of the wrong thing. (laughs) And they're worshiping these man-made idols here to what their own fingers have made is what the end of verse eight says. So there's condemnation here of idolatry, of greed, ungodly alliances, and warfare. Verse 9. So man is humbled, and each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. Isn't that interesting that Isaiah says, don't forgive them, Lord, because they have substituted faith with self-sufficiency. That ultimately is idolatry. Verse 10. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust. So the dust meaning abject humility of the defeated one. 
from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled. So these haughty looks, that is an outer manifestation of a proud heart. And so the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So we'll see this glorious revelation of the risen king. Verse 12, for the Lord of hosts has a day this day meaning any time that the Lord is victorious. And this is referring to not only just daytime, but meaning there will also be night time of judgment, or you will see the day of salvation. So for the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up or exalted, and it shall be brought low against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan against all the lofty mountains and against all the uplifted hills. So the oaks of Bashan referring to the proud and arrogant men, the lofty mountains referring to the government. And against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, so this referring to military might, against the ships of Tarshish, and against the beautiful craft, so this referring to the commerce and the arts of society and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low and the Lord alone will be exalted that day. So this entire section here is speaking of a proud society. They are arrogant and prideful in the fact that they have got a strong government, they have got a strong military, and they have got a decent economy. So let this be a warning to us if this is how we find our confidence in the fact that we live in a place that has a strong government, a strong military, and a strong economy, because these are things of man, not of God, right? And creation, ultimately, if it is proud and lofty, will be brought low. God is warning of that here. And the idols shall utterly pass away, or these worthless things, that's what this uh, word in Hebrew means. And people shall shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground. Why? Because they are going to be like frightened animals that are running from all of the terror. From before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. So there is going to be dread of the wicked at the sight of the Lord here. In that day, mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship to the moles and to the bats, to enter the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs. From before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty, when he rises to terrify the earth, stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath, for of what account is he? So he is saying, sever your ties with all of these things that are giving you false hope. Stop trusting in an impermanent and a transitory human. Because if men are only men, I love this quote, why do we give so much attention to their opinions? Why rise so high on the praise of men and get so low at their disapproval? We have something, someone even better to live for. Chapter three, we see now the judgment on Judah and Jerusalem. And when we start off here in verse one, where it says, for behold, this is showing the connection between chapter two and chapter three. So it's a continuation for behold, the Lord God of hosts. Now this Lord is the word Adonai, which means master or owner or sovereign. And Lord God of hosts, basically saying commander in chief. He is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water. So the leaders are going to be taken through sword and exile. The mighty men and the soldier, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the man of rank, the counselor and the skillful magician and the expert in charms. And I will make boys their princes and infants shall rule over them. Now this is fulfilled during this time in 2 Kings 24. So when a nation is in this kind of state, there will be ungodly, and inexperienced and incompetent leaders that are put into place, which ultimately will lead to a breakdown in society. So you will essentially have young and immature leadership at the helm. And the people will oppress one another, everyone his fellow and everyone his neighbor. So there's going to be this state of anarchy. The youth will be insolent to the elder and the despised to the honorable. So the wicked 
will be given over to their ways. Now, I know we don't like to have political discussions, and I don't even think this is a political discussion. This is just being observant of what is happening. We are now seeing the youth rising up. When we look at how universities are uh, having a lot of influence on the generation, and there is a lot of disrespect now on, toward elders from the younger generation. And so students are almost being valued more highly in society because their mindset is kind of taking over the ways of society now. You know, like the way that they are thinking and all of their ideas are being presented in such a way that are almost becoming the new ideals and the new morals of today's society. So we are seeing this playing out today in our time. Verse 6, For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak, and you shall be our leader, and this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. So they're basically saying, Listen, the fact that you've got a coat on, you can be our ruler. So this is any small qualification is now allowing leaders to be in their position that they're in. In that day, he will speak out saying, I will not be a healer. In my house, there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not make me leader of your people. So in this day, the people that uh, are being called upon to become leaders, they're like, mm -mm, I don't want any part of this. Verse eight, for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord defying his glorious presence. So this is an accusation of arrogance here and their speech and their deeds both against the Lord. So we will be not only judged according to what we've done, but according to the words we have spoken. Every idle word that we speak will be judged. We'll be justified and condemned for the words that we speak. So heart check, do your actions, but also your words glorify God is what you speak daily to people, the comments that you make on social media, are they glorifying to God? Verse nine, for the look on their faces bear witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom and they don't even hide it. So this is basically saying they're flaunting their sin now. It's not even in the dark anymore. They have guilty written all over their faces. They are basically saying, you know what, we don't want to be hypocrites, so we're just going to kind of conform to what's going on here. It's okay. But God says, woe to them, for they have brought evil upon themselves. So they're bringing now this judgment upon themselves. This is what is going to bring them down. It's their own sin. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. So this is a promise for blessing upon those who will not share the same fate of the wicked because God is going to protect the righteous in the midst of evil. And we can hold on to this hope too. If we are righteous before the Lord, he will protect us. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with them for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. So this is a promise of a blessing and a curse. My people, infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. This being a curse. Now this is not saying that if you've got women ruling over you, that that is a curse upon you. Not all women leaders are a bad thing. And we saw this through Deborah. We see this in Esther. These were women who were raised up by God to be leaders in their space and time. Oh, my people, your guides mislead you and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. So this is basically saying that these infants, these inexperienced rulers and these women, they are wicked rulers. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge peoples. So this Lord in the Hebrew is Yahweh, which is God's sacred name. So he is pleading his case here. He is both the prosecutor and the judge. And if you have someone who is both the prosecutor and the judge, then that is an ultimate and final guilty 
basically you have no chance <laughs> because the both the prosecutor and the judge are in cahoots with each other so this is saying god is both prosecutor and judge the lord will enter into judgment with the elders and princes of his people it is you who have devoured the vineyard the spoil of the poor is in your houses what do you mean by crushing my people by grinding the face of the poor declares the lord god of hosts so he's saying you've been taking advantage of the poor and simply to plunder them now the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, so basically they're being very seductive here, mincing along as they go, so they're taking these childlike steps like, woohoo, just live as we please, tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. So when we become, especially as women, degenerate, our influence on the next generation diminishes their hope for a godly future. You remember when I said that women are hardly spoken of in the Old Testament when it when we talk about you know when we look back on the family lines. Well, sometimes when women are spoken of when the mothers are mentioned, it is generally because they are highlighting the fact that the mother had a huge influence on that child's life. And so here he is speaking specifically to the daughters of Zion, the women, the proud women who are doing things however they please, living however they want to, in luxury, obsessed with their appearance. He is like, listen, you are going to influence your children. You are going to have an impact on this next generation. And this is still a calling for us today, both men and women, but I'm just specifically speaking for myself and what God spoke to my heart, because what has he called women to do and to be it is to have a gentle and a quiet spirit. That is our first and foremost priority. Now, that doesn't mean that you are, uh, you don't speak and that you are not bold in your faith because there have been godly women, a lot of them, who God uses in a powerful way where they have a gentle and quiet spirit, but they're still very bold in their faith. That doesn't mean that they are quiet in their faith, but it's just your countenance and the way that you present yourselves. So you can be bold while having that gentle and quiet spirit, and that is going to ultimately be more effective than being someone who is concerned with only their outward appearance, but with a crappy heart, <laughs> you know, in the way that you live out your life and the way that you talk. So both men and women can take from this, but I'm just specifically speaking right now for myself and for the women who really truly have been called to have a powerful impact on the generations. Because we, as mothers especially, we raise up the children. I mean, we do have that influence on how to raise them. Men are equally responsible, but... God has still given us a big calling as mothers and that's spiritual mothers too. Verse 18, in that day, the Lord will take away the refine or the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the scarves, the headdresses, armlets, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, signet rings, nose rings, festal robes, mantles, cloaks, handbags, mirrors, linen garments, turbans, and the veils. So all this stuff that you've concerned yourself with to look good, it's all going to be stripped away. Instead of perfume, there's going to be rottenness. And instead of a belt, a rope. So these are the condition, conditions being prophesied over those who are about to head into exile. Instead of well-set hair, baldness, because their heads will be shaved when they get taken into, into, uh, taken into captivity. Instead of a well, or instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth. Branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in a battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn empty. She shall sit in the ground. So their entire city is going to fall. The men are going to be lost in battle. So these women who were using their outward beauty and seduction to get these men, even those men are going to be taken away. So God can take away all things. And we have to live our lives that way. You know, being grateful for the things that we have, but living in such a way that it can be taken away at any moment. And what would you do in that case if all was stripped away? Chapter four, and seven women shall take hold of one man in that day. 
saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. So their reproach at this point is going to be the fact that they are unmarried and barren because there are not enough men here. They are basically going to have to beg men to be the father of their children because all of the men will have died in war. So there will be more women left than men. Now, some scholars and commentators say that this is referring to the time of tribulation. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious or shall be dazzling with beauty. And the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. So basically, when this happens, there will be an awakening here. The curse will be broken. Their land will be restored. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. So this remnant will be sanctified. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. So this is that purging purification, this purging fire that will consume the faithless and purify the faithful. Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day. So he's going to refashion this cloud that once sat above Mount Zion and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. So there will be this protection over Mount Zion, which is the glory and communion which is the tangible presence of God. Chapter five, this is now day 191. The vineyard of the Lord destroyed. So this vineyard is the most prized possession in this time, a vineyard of a person. It required constant care. So we are seeing this metaphor of the vineyard of the Lord. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard or his people, which is the most prized possession of God. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill, so they were blessed at one time. They were bearing fruit. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. So God was looking to his people to be fruitful, but it yielded wild grapes. This Wild grapes can be translated to stinking things, meaning they were rebellious, they were useless, they were unprofitable. So starting off here with a heart check, are we bearing fruit or are we wild grapes? Are we useful and being a blessing in the kingdom of God or are we rebellious, are we useless, are we unprofitable to the kingdom? Verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, O men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you, so this is a warning for them, what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. So basically he's saying, I'm going to turn you over to your sin so that you will feel your own pain and repent. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. So there will not only be drought, but there will also be anarchy after the exile of the people in this land. It's basically going to be barren. It's going to be trampled upon. There will be nothing left but craziness in this land for the vineyard of the lord of hosts is the house of israel and the men of judah are his pleasant planting and he looked for justice but behold bloodshed for righteousness but behold an outcry so now we see the six woes that are being spoken of to the wicked people or the to those wild grapes and this is the judgment that we'll see upon them Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is no more room and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. So this is speaking of greed, like greedy real estate, and they are going to become slaves to their own land in the end. 
The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield but an ephah. So there's going to be drought, meaning an infertile land, and there's going to be desolation upon these houses. They're going to be left empty. And so a lot of vacancies, unsold homes, and we see this in the form of corrupt capitalism. There are going to be businesses that are going to go under in this time. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. So this is speaking of debauchery, drunkenness, indulgence, kind of this egocentric living. These people who live like, we work hard, so we're going to play hard. We're going to party it up. They have lyre and harp, tambourine, flute, wine at their feast, but they do not regard the deeds of the Lord or see the works of his hand. And so this is also speaking of hedonism or the pursuit of pleasure above all else. So this kind of eat, drink, and be merry kind of lifestyle. Therefore, my people go into exile for lack of knowledge. This is prophetic of the fact, because it hasn't happened yet, that the people will be exiled. Their honored men go hungry, and their multitude is parched with thirst. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure. And the nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude will go down, and her revelers, and he who exults in her. So this is prophesying the captivity and the death for prideful leaders. Man is humbled and each one is brought low, and the eyes of the haughty are brought low. So this is humiliation for those who have no respect, humiliation for all. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. So remember that this judgment is always with justice and righteousness being involved in that. Remember when I said that justice and righteousness go hand in ham, ham, hand in hand with this purification and this redemption process. Then shall the lambs graze as in their pasture and nomads shall eat among the ruins of the rich. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood who draw sin as with cart ropes. So these people at this point are not just falling into sin. They are working for it. These people who say, let him be quick, let him speed his work that we may see it. So they're like, bring it on, Lord. They've almost got like this cynical unbelief. So this is speaking of liberalism, of looseness. Now, I'm not saying liberalism in the political sense, but liberal, the word liberal, meaning they are living like, woo, you know, they're being very loose in their ways. Let the arm, let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and let it come that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So this is speaking of perversion. The fact that people are now blurring moral issues. They are excusing sin. This is relativism and existalism. Meaning, do whatever you feel is good. You wake up and you feel like you are X, Y, and Z. Go ahead and be that. They're like, there's no absolutes in this life. Do whatever seems right to you. Does it sound familiar? Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. So this is arrogance or intellectualism. Woe to those who are heroes and are drinking at drinking wine and valiant men and mixing strong drink who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his rights. This is speaking of injustice or alcoholism. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble and as dry grass sinks down in the flame, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom go up like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So the wicked are going to be cut off with no hope. There's going to be sudden and complete and severe judgment. Verse 25, therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people and he stretched out his hand against them and struck them and the mountains quaked and their corpses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. They become trash basically. For all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. He will raise a signal for nations far away and whistle for them from the ends of the earth and behold quickly, speedily they come. So this is speaking of the Assyrian army, which is at the ready to 
Come and plunder them. None is weary, none stumbles, none slumbers or sleeps. Not a waistband is loose, not a sandal strap broken. Their arrows are sharp, all their bows bent. Their horses' hoofs seem like flint and their wheels like the whirlwind. Their roaring is like a lion, like young lions they roar. They growl and seize their prey. They carry it off and none can rescue. They will growl over it on that day like the growling of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold darkness and distress and the light is darkened by its clouds this referring to the judgment it's symbolic of the darkness that is about to come upon them and a lot of people would look at this and say how can we say that God loves us but God's judgment is always based on love for his people the enemy on the other hand his judgment is based on hate chapter 6 in the year that King Uzziah died, so let's remember who King Uzziah is. He was the king who ruled from 740, or no, he died in 740 BC, but he ruled for 52 years. This was something we read in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 26. He was loved by the people, remember? He was elected king. He was a man of peace and prosperity. He brought strength to the nation. He was militarily strong. But the thing is, is that the people put so much faith in him as a leader that, to, that it wasn't until he died that the glory of God was seen. That is what the vision is here of Isaiah. And I, and I talked about this when we read this. In the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. So it took Uzziah dying for the glory of God to be seen, even though he was a good man. And this temple... The robe filling the temple, this is, in other words, palace, which means God's throne on earth as a counterpart in heaven. So this is reflecting God's throne. So when it says that he's high and lifted up, this is showing the eternal, sovereign, and universal rule, but also a God who is concerned about his people. Verse 2, above him stood the seraphim, the seraphim meaning the burning ones. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, which shows humility and concealing. With two he covered his feet, which again shows this adoration and humility. And with two he flew, so these two wings used for service. Now notice that we've got four wings for humility and adoration, and two wings for service. So our humility and adoration for God should always be greater than our service. They go hand in hand, doesn't mean one over the other, but our adoration and humility is more important first before we go into service. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Now these seraphim were not just programmed beings. They are incredibly intelligent. They are fixed though on God's holiness. The fact that they are so intelligent and all they do all day is just cry out, holy, holy, holy. That is how big God's holiness is. Because when holy was spoken twice, that meant most holy. Imagine now holy being spoken of three times. This is the highest of holy. It is indescribable in human language because the transcendence of God is so incredible. He is perfect, yet he still cares for us, people who don't deserve to be cared for. Now this holy, 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 the fact that they say it three times, this is not proving the Godhead, but it is a manifestation of the Godhead. The fact that they say holy is Father God. Holy is the Son of God. Holy is the Holy Spirit, the Lord of hosts. Now this obviously contrasts with the pride of Uzziah, right? And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. So he's like, Isaiah now is looking at this site and like, oh my gosh, I am undone here. Because he hears the seraphim crying out, holy, holy, holy. And he also sees that this place is filled with smoke. So he shook at the voice and also at the sight. 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And he knows, now that he is seeing and hearing the presence of God, that he is now under judgment. And so this happens to us. When we hear and see the Lord, we become undone, and we need to be undone. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing, to become undone before the Lord. Because we need to see our unworthiness in order to see his worthiness of being praised and being served. So Isaiah is seeing that here. He's like, I'm the only one who's not praising God. I'm the only one who is sitting here with unclean lips. The things that I've spoken or even not spoken. My lips are unclean and I know that I am not worthy. So woe is me, he's saying. But listen to what happens here. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So this coal is representing the purification of the blood and the fire of the spirit that enables him to speak now his words. So the words of God will now have power. The words in his mouth are now going to be powerful. And the coal also representing sacrifice because it comes from the altar. And that ultimately leads to the ability for this forgiveness to take place. So he went from woe is me to now forgiven. And look what's going to happen next. After he's forgiven, he has this personal encounter with God, this personal atonement. Verse 8, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? This us referring to the Godhead and the angels together. Then I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Heart check. When God is out calling for willing servants and he comes to you saying, who am I going to be able to trust, to come with us, to do our work. Will you say, here I am, Lord, send me. Because God is never going to force us to work for him. He asks us to work for him. And so if we say that, if, if you answer that heart check and said, yes, I will say, here I am, Lord, send me, then your task today is to start where you're at. Start in your own family. Start in your workplace. Start with whoever you encounter, the way that you speak to them, the way that you love people, the way that you forgive those who have hurt you, the way that you are walking in humility. All of the things that we are called and tasked to do, you can start where you're at. And he said, go. So woe is me to forgiven, to asking the question, will you go? And now go. He's giving the command, go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. So he's like, I need you to go and preach to the people who won't listen. Because only the humble are going to hear and understand and then respond. But these people are not humble, so they're not going to hear and respond. This is a very discouraging thing for people in ministry. To preach to people who aren't going to respond to them. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and the blind and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So our calling is not to be, quote, successful in ministry. Our calling is simply to be obedient to the call. So it is not for us to worry about the response whenever we minister to people or try to encourage people with the word, our calling is simply just to plant the seed and let God do the rest, right? So here, this is again an encouragement for us when we say, Lord, open my eyes, ears, and heart because that is so important for us to then be able to have that repentant heart and then be healed of whatever's going on within us. Because if we don't have eyes to under, uh, eyes to see, you know, ears to hear and hearts to understand, then how will we be healed? Because we don't know the thing by which we are being healed. So we have to be able to hear, see, and understand it. Then I said, how long, O oh Lord? 
Are they going to be re- unresponsive? That's what he's basically saying. And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste. So basically, not until I bring my judgment upon them. And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, so this is giving us hope here, there will be a remnant, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. So this is referring to the Babylonian exile. And in chapter 38, King Hezekiah does repent. It's all part of the process for this beautiful branch to come forth, which is Jesus. And in the end here, it says, the holy seed is its stump. This holy seed, meaning the offspring, is the stump that remains when it fell. Chapter 7. In the days of Ahaz, Ahaz was a wicked king. And in chapters 7 through 12 now, we are hearing about the Syro Ephraimite wars. So, in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Reason, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not mount an attack against it. So, we see this alliance that is forming because of the fear of the Assyrians. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, Ephraim referring to Israel, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Why are they shaking? Well, they're in fear because Syria has defeated them earlier. And the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Now we look at this and like, where in the world is that? It doesn't really matter. This is just written to show these were very real people and real places. This is not a fairy tale here. And Shear Jashub means a remnant will return. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Reason and Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabiel as king in the midst of it. Tabiel meaning good for nothing. So, He is saying, I need you to pay attention here. I need you to trust God. These big and fiery threats, though they look scary, they are going to be like shrubs. They are shrubs to God. So they will be like shrubs to you. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is reason. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Now these you spoken of here are in the plural sense. So he is speaking to all people here. Now, we know that they are not uh, firm in their faith, right? But the New King James Version says it this way, if you will not believe, you will not be established. So this is a play on the words, these words believe and establish, play on the same Hebrew word that means amen. And so this is kind of establishing when we say amen, this is that so be it. And in order to something, in order for something to take its place. We have to believe for it to be established. That's how amen comes to happen. You know, when we say amen, let it, let it be Lord, let it be so. Well, it's not going to be so if we don't believe first, right? So I wrote up here real big in my paper, if you are not firm in faith, you're, or you will not be firm at all. I love that. I, that like, jumped out of the paper for me. Verse 10, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep at Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz says, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. Now this sounds holy, but the thing is, is God just straight up asking him to do this thing. And if God asks us to do something, we better do it, right? And he said, hear that, O house of David. Is it too little for you to be weary for you to weary men that you weary my God also. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He shall eat curds and honey. Curds and honey referring to the simple diet 
uh, now in this ravished land as opposed to the bread and wine that they used to eat. And so this means he's going to be just like us when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. So he's going to be tempted just like us. He's going to go through trials just like us. He is going to be simple and humble just like us. He's going to go through everything that we go through on this earth and in this life, yet he's still going to refuse evil and still be sinless and choose good. Incredible. Verse 16, for before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So we will see this near fulfillment of this prophecy taking place. We don't know who Emmanuel is uh, when this happens back in this day, but ultimately the one we focus on is the ultimate fulfillment of Jesus coming to the birth of the virgin. Now this virgin... We know that, you know, this immaculate conception that takes place with Mary doesn't happen with anybody else. So this virgin for the near fulfillment um, could actually mean young woman. So Emmanuel will be born to a young woman. And <clears throat> that is when this is going to take place for the people in this time. But the ultimate fulfillment being Jesus born to the Virgin Mary. Verse 18, in that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the cleft of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the treasures. So they are going to be invaded or boxed in by both Assyria and Egypt. And I think I wrote Judah. So correct your notes there because I see it. I did not mean to write Judah. I meant to write Egypt. So make sure you make that correction in your notes. If I remember, I'll try to re-photograph this page. And basically he is saying there is going to be humiliation here. In that, uh, in that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river. So Ahaz, remember, tried to pay them off with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair and the, of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. This is not very much here. And because of the abundance of milk, so it's gonna look like an abundance because of how very few people are left that they give, he will eat curds for everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will come briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread, so their land will no longer be cultivated. Chapter 8, then... So this, again, connects chapter 7 and 8. The Lord said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters. So meaning, I want everyone to be able to say this. This is going to be a public proclamation. I want many people to be able to see and hear it and ponder it. Belonging to Meher Shalal Hashbaz. This means hasten to the prey. This is saying invasion is coming. And I will get reliable witnesses Remember that witnesses were so important in order to validate the testimony of people. So he is saying, I'm going to have reliable witnesses here to validate what's being said. Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah to attest for me. Now Zechariah is not the prophet who writes the book of Zechariah. Just making that note. And I went to the prophetess, or his wife, this is Isaiah's wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Meher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to cry my father and my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. So this is a prediction of the fall of Samaria. The Lord spoke to me again, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over reason and the son of Remaliah. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river. So basically the people are not happy with this calm and peaceful life that they have been living. The beautiful, flowing, gentle uh, waters of Shiloh, right? They're not happy with their calm and small stream. So God is going to give them a crazy rapid river like the Euphrates. 
um, the craziness that is going to overtake them will be like the pagan gods, but all of these things at the hand of God. So they are envying the great and mighty and wanting to become like them. So God is like, you know what? You want to cry about what you don't have? I'll give you something to cry about. So I'm going to give them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over its banks. And it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. And its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. So Assyria essentially is going to devastate Judah, but will not annihilate it because God needs it, needs that remnant to continue. So heart check here. Do we act like the people here where we are not content with the peace and tranquility? We feel like we don't have the time to sit before the Lord, to be still in prayer, to be still in meditation of the word because we are looking at all of the raging rivers around us instead and being filled with anxiety and worry in our soul and being overwhelmed by what's going on around us. So are you content with the waters of Shiloa or are you longing for the waters of the river? And he continues here in verse nine, be broken you peoples and be shattered. Give ear all you far countries, strap on your armor and be shattered, strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. Remember, Emmanuel, God with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of the people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all this that the people call conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. This was another one of those things that popped off the page where I wrote down real big at the top, Do not call conspiracy all that this people call conspiracy, and do not be in dread. In today's world and society. There are all kinds of conspiracies in all realms floating around and people get scared because of it. We don't have to be in dread. Our fear should be fear of the Lord. We will either live in fear of God or live in fear of man. So heart check, which one are you going to choose? Are you going to live in fear of man and their conspiracies or live in fear of God and his peace? Are you willing to be a failure in the eyes of the world if it means being obedient to God? Verse 13, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. There it is. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So God is going to be a sacred defender and a protector. He is a sanctuary for those who believe, but he is going to be a stumbling block for unbelievers. And the wicked in the end will not prevail for long. So when he speaks to the stumbling of both houses, he is referring to both Israel and Judah. So another heart check, are you more worried about what the enemy is doing rather than your position with God as your defender? Verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. So he is saying, I need you guys to make a legal transaction here. Uh, He wants Isaiah's disciples to bind the law because by making it a legal transaction, this will prove prove its authenticity when the prophecy is fulfilled. So he is basically saying here in verse 17, "Ah, look at us. You know, we're the message. He's saying, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. So this hope, this waiting for is meaning keeping your eyes on the word and the fulfillment of that word, having this confident expectation that it will be fulfilled and that God will deliver his people and meet their needs. That's what he's saying when he's saying, I'll hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and importance in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? 
to the teaching and to the testimony. So he's like, enough with all this false religion, enough with, you know, trying to consult the things that are ultimately dead. Get back to the word. You know, if what people say ever contradict the word of God, then those people are just wrong. Just plain and simple. They're in the dark. He's like, get back to the word. The word is true and it doesn't return void. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land. This is, this is the wicked who refuse God. They will pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. So this is that declaration of judgment. There is going to be moral and spiritual blight and this loss of freedom. So Lord... We come to you with humility, hearing this word today, knowing, Jesus, that you are coming back, that there is going to be a judgment, but that there is also the hope that there is going to be a restoration, not only for Israel, but just for all of your people on this earth. So when we read of the doom and gloom, God, we may have read this word before and been so discouraged, but I just pray that you will reinstate that hope in your people today, that we can keep our eyes on you, to keep ourselves focused on your word, knowing that you are our protector, our defender, our redeemer, and that even in the midst of a crazy world, God, here you are hovering over us. We are able to find that refuge in the shadow of your wings. We are able to sit securely in this faith that you have established in us, that you have grown in us, God, that it is not blind, but sees the things of God. We are able to see what you are doing. We see your hand working, God. We know that you are sovereign still today as you were before, and therefore we do not have to fear what is going on around us because we put our hope in you and you alone. So thank you for this word again of encouragement, God. And I just pray that it will envelop your people today, that it will wrap around them with so much security and peace that all of their worries and anxieties will melt away. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die. But I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.